Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We're here in Carlsbad, California at the Navigating the Politicized Economy Summit, McKinsey Research and Sprott Global. And we have the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. And how can we get more into the politicized economy than that? So can you update those who weren't here with a little bit on what you said today? And then we'll go from there. Well, yeah, I can't take as long, of course. Uh, how do you make it uh, accurate and short? I guess. The basic thing that I was trying to accomplish today mm -hmm. in a short period of time is take a look into the future. Because everybody at this conference, or most people I guess, are concerned about the way things are changing in the economy. And they know that the old rules that used to apply, that the old idea of American free enterprise and the free markets, those rules have been changed and we're living in a different environment now. And uh, people are wanting to know how does this affect me and my retirement and my savings and uh, what kind of a world are my children going to live under and this sort of thing. So uh, my job was to try and project some of these trends that we find today into the future and to see what, what's coming down the line. It's not as hard to do as you might think um, because, you know, if you want to project uh, anything, you, you get a graph and you see where we are now, where we were, where we came from, and you just draw a straight line between those two points and you can see where we're headed. And my theme was that unless we make some major changes in the forces that are acting on the, on the economy today, unless some very drastic changes are made, we're gonna continue heading in exactly the same direction that we have been heading for the last 100 years. And if you project that line into the future, you don't have to go another 100 years to realize that here we have the growth of government every year, every month, it's a little more, more inclusive, it's more control over our lives, we have less freedom, you have more inflation, you have more social unrest, we have more fraud in the government, we've got uh, uh, more uh, banking schemes to create money out of nothing in order to make sure the banks are paid off, and, you know, all of these things, Obviously. these are, things that have been going on for a hundred years and they're accelerating now. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to project that line and you can see that definitely within the next generation for certain and maybe a lot sooner than that, we're going to come to the end of that line. If we've gone from let's say 20% uh, government a hundred years ago to 80% government now, where are we headed? A hundred percent government, aren't we? And how long will that take? A hundred percent government means totalitarianism. Uh, if we see the decline in the purchasing power of the dollar, 100 years ago, a dollar was worth so many hamburgers, let's say. All right, today, uh, it takes $100 to get the same number of hamburgers with it. So we've seen the decline in the purchasing power of the dollar for the last uh, 100 years. Where is that going? It's heading to zero, you see? So that was my job, is to bring the bad news to the front and ask people to stop being in denial, to stop thinking that, well, everything's gonna turn out okay if we just leave it alone. We have to make some very important changes. Do you find in general that people are even, let alone willing, but even able to comprehend that message? Most people think, well, that can't happen here. That doesn't happen in America. This can't happen to us. I, when you, when you say things like this, do people run away or do they disbelieve you or how do you, how do you get over that? Well, some do, there's no question about that. But I find that uh, a lot fewer do it now than they than used to. Hmm. And when I first started to talk like this, which was when my book came out in 1994 and I had projected certain trends into the future, all of which have come true now. But you know, that was 18 years ago, people thought I was crazy to be talking about a, a banking crisis and, you know, and a collapse of the purchasing power of the dollar and things like that. And, ah, what kind of a uh, nut are you? Well, no, we're living through it, aren't we? And so it's easier to say, hey, things are not going well. We can see that in our lifetime. So to answer your question, most people today are open to a discussion. They may not like it, they may prefer that we change the topic and talk about, you know, who's going who's gonna to win the election or who's going to win the baseball game or something like that. Um, but more people are open to the, the realities of the economy than they used to be. That's interesting. Okay, so taking those people who you can even speak with then, mm -hmm. you started out by saying, well, unless we have serious changes, we are coming to the end of the line. 
but in a politicized situation, you know, how realistic is the idea of any serious change? How can any politician get elected promising the painful medicine that you and I both know needs to happen? Uh, are you really saying that we are coming to the end of the line no matter what because the changes won't be embraced? Or, or are you an optimist and if so, on what basis? Well, I don't consider myself to be an optimist nor a pessimist. I like to think of myself as a realist. And realistically speaking, I think what you just said is correct, that the chances of there being a great awakening among the masses of the American people in time mm -hmm. to avert some very serious consequences, the chances are small, but they're not zero. See, that's the point. And it depends to a large extent on how energetic and successful we are in getting this message out. And it's not just the message about, hey, look how bad things are, but the rest of that message is, why are they that way? Right. Who did that to us? Are they still in positions of power? Are they still doing the same thing to us? And so forth. If that message gets across, then the next message is, it's time to make a change in who is in power, who we elect. And that means a challenge of the two-party system, really. And mm -hmm. that's hard to yes, do. Yeah. But I think now more and more people are beginning to realize that the two-party system really is a, is a cover for a one-party system. It's, it's a means by which they keep the public content thinking that they're you know, controlling their own political destiny right. by, oh, I'm going to vote Republican. No, I, that didn't work. I'll vote Democrat. He's the better guy, and so forth. And they realize now, after all these years, we go back and forth, back and forth. We get a change in administration, a change in political party labels, but no change in major policies, you see. So now I think the time has come when this idea is ready, is really ripe now. And so I guess the bottom line is that these are very exciting times to live in, <laughs> and we have a chance to actually make a difference right now. That brings to mind the Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times. Exactly. We live in interesting times. Very interesting times but, indeed. But you bring up something interesting. I mean, you know, we think of the two-party system, we think of these two parties we writ large as sort of written in the bedrock of the universe. It seems like it's always been that way. But it started out with Whigs and Tories, and in this country. Mm -hmm. And things do change. You get to points where history happens, uh, the Civil War happens, or, or major changes happen. Um, I, I guess to focus in a little bit on the question, I can see that changing if we get to the end of the line, if the wheels come off the current system. Uh, people will get uncomfortable enough, they will be hungry enough, literally, to mm -hmm. demand change. But can it really happen before then, you know, before Joe Sixpack? Uh, it turns on the switch on the TV and it doesn't work because there's no power. You know, can we really get that sort of person to reconsider the realities that they've been ignoring all this time? It's a good question. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I'll go back to what I said a moment ago. It's unlikely, to tell you the truth. I think it's unlikely. But it's not impossible, and that's what I'm counting on. Rather than uh, just sitting there and doing nothing because it's <laughs> unlikely, we've got to do something, <laughs> well, right? Well, you wrote The Creature from Jekyll mm -hmm. Island 18 years ago. Has there been a change in perception of the book? Has it become perceived as, well, you know, it was 18 years ago, it doesn't matter? Or have people paid more attention to it now? Gee, you were right. Have you seen anything over that time? That yes, exactly what you said. The, when it first came out, it was sort of a, an academic little study, and there were some people interested who were already students and scholars in that field, but no great interest because things were very good. You know, the economy was bubbling along, and there were no tent cities, you know, right. all of these, employment was high, and all of these things. And of course, I could see that all of that was, you know, coming apart, and that there was going to be a lot of fallout. Uh, but most people didn't see it yet. Well, now it's underway. It's fully underway. And I've seen that the interest in the book has just accelerated tremendously. We've, um, we've come a long way in the beginning, pretty much ignored by the mainstream media. Um, now we've, um, we get honorable mention, even on the mainstream media, that for the most part is opposed to what we're saying, but at least they, they mention us, sometimes not kindly, but they mention us. Uh, we get, uh, we've been on... Uh, sometimes bad press is better than no press. Bad press is better than no press, and uh, we've had some good press coverage. Uh, we've been on Fox News quite a few times. When, uh, anyway, we went to that, but um, we've had a lot of good coverage. So, and it's continuing. 
So uh, the book now is in its fifth edition, and it's I think it's the 38th printing, which wow. is amazing. Yeah, congratulations. Well, thank you, but I don't think I deserve uh, credit for any of it. I just wrote the facts, and history has caught up mm -hmm. with all of that, and that's creating the environment where the, it's hit the public nerve. Is there something that can happen? Is there something in the book that you uh, predicted or are calling for or uh, a turn of events that you can say, look, because of how things are and what we've exposed about the system and its origins and its true nature, look at what's happening in the world today. This really shows that what I said is true and deserves attention because, you know, 18 years ago, it was sort of a, a radical libertarian tinfoil hat kind of idea. And now it's at least being discussed more. Is there some point like, you know, Einstein, when he first promulgated his ideas, it was very strange thinking in 1908 and 1912. But then they started seeing light then, right? And there was prediction mm -hmm. 30 years after mm -hmm. the fact that what he predicted based on his theory came true. Is there something like that? I think there that is, we can actually. Point to and say, I, I think that Einstein's E equals MC square, uh, you know, was the center of that, um, of that, uh, that was the epicenter of all his theories. I think in, in our case, the, uh, the epicenter was the realization that the Federal Reserve System is a cartel mm -hmm. and not an agency of the federal government. That single fact alone is, when you think about it, is so shocking to most people, or it should be, because mm -hmm. we've been raised to think that it's you know, the government and that they're looking after us, and to think that it's no different than an oil cartel or a banana cartel that simply happens to be a banking cartel and that we've given them the monopoly to create the money of the United States and that they can create it out of nothing and charge interest on nothing. And all of these pieces start falling into place when you realize that this is not in the best interest of the American people, was never designed to be from the, from the get-go, and it's been a means of legalized plunder of the American people. That fact all stems from the realization that the Federal Reserve is a cartel mm -hmm. and not a government agency. So I think that's it. Hmm. It occurs to me that maybe the, the Occupy people even though that's not my kind of guide. Usually I don't go hang out on the street corners with my Occupy uh -huh. sign. Mm -hmm. But that anger that they tapped into and the reason that became a, a worldwide movement, it, it connects directly to what you're saying. On a gut level, a lot of people realize that things have been set up and they're not for the people's benefit. Right. Is that, are you finding that other people are listening now who weren't listening before because of yeah, like I this. think that's it exactly. People realize that they're being had, you know, they've been fooled, they've been exactly. deceived over and over and over again. But unfortunately, some of them, particularly in the Occupy movement, don't have the big picture yet because they may resent the fact that there's some very wealthy people in the banking industry and the politicians who are living high while, you know, the average guy on the street is not living well at all. And so they, they get out there and say, this is capitalism. We must bring down capitalism. Not realizing that what they're looking at and this, uh, this, this, this uh, difference between the haves and the have-nots, that's not capitalism at all. They, they don't understand, you know, the fact that this is favoritism. This is socialism but that we already have. They're advocating, you know, more government control as though somehow our elected representatives are all saints, and if we just had some politicians running everything, everything would be fine, they think. So they're a little, you know, have a lot to learn yet. They keep calling for more of the same bad medicine that's brought us to this point. Right. You know, it's it's uh, egregious for somebody to lose so much money and then get a government bailout and then get a bonus for that, huh? but who gave them the bailout? I mean, the government. You know, that's the government is making the wrong decision again. Well, that, we're back to the realization that the Fed is a cartel, but it's more than a cartel. It's a cartel in partnership with the federal government. We really have a kind of a duopoly here. The bankers and the politicians have formed this uh, partnership that works very well for both of them, you know. And the revolving door. Revolving yeah. door. And it, it, see, in order to create money out of nothing, which the Fed does, they need an act of Congress to authorize it, okay? So that's where their buddies in Congress say, okay, we vote another trillion dollars to help the poor people of this country because we want them to have jobs and we want to give them work. So we'll create a big employment 
machine and we're going to create jobs and so we'll create another trillion dollars and but nobody asks well where does the money come from well the politicians raise their hand they vote for the money they don't have the money of course but they vote for a trillion dollars because we're going to do jobs for people and so they get elected they're they're big heroes right but they don't realize that then the federal reserve says okay the congress has just demanded another trillion dollars it doesn't have it so we will create this trillion dollars because that's our part of the partnership and we will give it to the government to spend on jobs and where does the money come from well that's a big mystery isn't it it comes out of thin air which means it floods into the economy and it pushes down the purchasing power of all the other dollars that are already out there which means inflation that's where it comes from so all of the people who are supposedly being benefited benefited by jobs or whatever it is are paying for this thing out of one pocket they put you know ten dollars out of this pocket and they get one dollar and fifty cents back here and they think oh we've been saved by our great politicians and our bankers and that's the game so what do you say to the people who say well if that's true how come we've seen a roughly tripling of the money supply since 2008 and prices haven't tripled Good question. Um, prices have not tripled, that's true, but prices have gone up a lot more than most people think. And if you just go and, and look at the cost of groceries, you'll realize that prices, real price increases are much higher than what the government figures indicate because they fudge the numbers. But the other reason for that is that a lot of the money that's been created in this country has been snapped up by other countries around the world because they want U.S. dollars for their transactions. Believe it or not, their economies, <laughs> economies are even worse than ours. You know, and you take a little country like Zimbabwe, for example, and you've seen pictures of little kids with armloads of trillion dollar notes and they're going out to buy a sandwich with all of this money. I mean, they cannot conduct a, a realistic uh, financial transaction using Zimbabwe dollars. It's impossible. So any meaningful financial transactions have to be done in something else, well, it turns out that, so far at least, the U.S. dollar has been the reserve currency of the world, so they want U.S. dollars to do those transactions. So that means that a huge quantity of this newly created money in America has been sent out to all these other countries. So we're and exporting they're stuck our inflation. With, we're exporting our inflation, yes, exactly. And so those countries are, they're suffering, they're paying terribly for that. But it's, it's better than using their own native money because it's even worse. That process has saved America for many years, but that's coming to an end now. More and more other countries do not want U.S. dollars because they see that its value is going down, down, down. So we're coming to the end of that game. Uh, another thing uh, that we have to keep in mind is that a lot of this money that's being created is going into the coffers of the very wealthy. The, the, I won't say just the wealthy because that makes it sound like it's uh, the rich versus the poor. It's the politically favored class. Mm -hmm. They're wealthy because, not, not because they, they produced something of value, not because they're in manufacturing or they provide some great service, it's because they've got political connections and they have lobbyists. It's not Apple, it's Goldman Sachs. It's Goldman Sachs. Or something that rhymes with that. We don't want to pick on it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, exactly. <laughs> they have purchased their success through political power, uh, through lobbying activities. So it, it's a terrible thing to realize, but it is the reality of our day that most of the big corporate successes that we see are uh, able to achieve their profits not through free enterprise competition, but because they have purchased politicians who have voted for legislation which gives those corporations an advantage over their competitors. And the consumer, once again, is the guy that winds up paying for all of that. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the system has changed, and that's how we started. We used to live in a free enterprise competitive system. Now we're living in a politicized economy and we're living in a world where the wealthiest people are not the producers who produce goods and services for the common man and raise his standard of living, but the ones that have political connections. And that process, if it is not stopped, if it is not reversed, is going to continue leading us in that direction until finally we reach the end of the line, which is totalitarianism, and the free markets are dead, and we will, be living, we will be living in a command economy based on the Soviet model or the Red China model. 
that's where we're headed. So you say there's some small chance we can change that. How do we do that? What, what possible, never mind politically realistic, but just what possible path is there? I'm glad you said forget that? realism. Let's go for yeah. possibilities. Yes. Let's think about possibilities because major events of history have often suddenly gone against realistic odds. And the American Revolution would probably be a shining example. Yes, There's no chance in the world that the, <laughs> that the American Revolution was going to be won against the most... A bunch of ragtag armies. A bunch armies of ragtag the, yeah. armies. Oh, man, there was no chance. And Washington had no funding. They didn't have ammunition for their rifles. The guys didn't have clothes. They were freezing. And yet, they won the war. So uh, forget realistic. Let's think of possibilities. I think the way this has to be turned around and will be returned around, will be turned around, is that uh, first there's the awakening stage. You and I are participating in that right now. Maybe somebody will see this video who might just become a dynamo and carry it to others. And through their efforts and our efforts and the efforts of millions of people we don't even know doing the same thing, we could break out of the mainstream media confines and get this message out to huge numbers of people. Thank goodness for the internet. Thank goodness for the internet. That's why the powers that be are trying their best to clamp down on the internet right now mm -hmm. and to keep scaring us. They say, oh, we got child pornography out there, we got terrorism, we got all these, we crime and so forth. We got to control the internet for you, to protect you and your children, right? And of course, their real concern is that they don't want a free exchange of ideas. And so they're using that to generate support for their schemes. So yeah, thank God for the internet for now. And we have to fight to keep it free and open. The next step, of course, is to realize what to do with this information. We've got to replace those people who are now in positions of power. As long as they're there, we're not going to accomplish anything. That's the reason, by the way, that we created an organization back in 2002 called Freedom Force International, based on the recognition that we must mobilize people of like mind to go into the positions of authority and responsibility, political power, and recapture control of the political parties and the elected representatives. That's where the power rests. Until we get hold of that, I mean, there's nothing we can do. But the good news is, it doesn't take a lot of people to do that. It doesn't take 51% of the population. History has always been directed by 1% or less. The dedicated few that knew what they were doing are willing to make sacrifices for it and work hard. Go back to the American Revolution again. How many people fought in the American Revolution? Two, three percent, not even that. How many people led the American Revolution? 0.00001%? The, you know, the intellectual movement, the leadership of the whole independence of this country was in the hands of just a few people. But they were, they had positions of authority and they were respected and people followed them. We have to, and this is the mission of Freedom Force, is to get our people into those positions where we can provide that kind of leadership. But not to rain on your parade, it was also uh, an idea whose time had come, right? We, we came out of the Enlightenment, the kinds of ideas mm -hmm. that those leaders stood for mm -hmm. and took the country down that path towards were ideas in the ascendancy mm -hmm. and they were what uh, the intellectuals of the day were discussing and debating and so on. You had the Enlightenment, you had the beginnings of the scientific revolution, the industrial era and so on. Um, but the ideas in the ascendancy now are gayism and you know, revamped, redressed versions of socialism and mm -hmm. so on. And mm -hmm. We've got generations of government education which teaches that you're crazy and I'm wrong and, mm -hmm. and they're right and they're mm -hmm. holy. And well, very well stated. And that is our, our, that is our obstacle. That is what we must overcome. But I think there's a parallel there. What we're talking about here and the ideas that are expressed in the movement of Freedom Force International, in our era, is an idea whose time has come. It's here now. People are fed up with the, uh, the rhetoric of collectivism and socialism and communism. They're fed up. They know that these are just hollow phrases and slogans. They know that they don't produce the glorious results that they thought when they were school children. You know? I use that analogy because uh, I'm not talking about real school children, but even adults you know, go through a, a learning phase when it comes to ideology. You don't have to 
you know, have to be a, a child to learn about ideology. Some of us, you know, delayed a long time before we, <laughs> we got out of kindergarten and began to really study ideology and, and political philosophy. So uh, my point is we are living now in a time where there is an idea whose time has come. And that's I this hope you're right. Well, I'm at, counting at the, on it. At the end of the day, reality matters. And if mm -hmm. the system is breaking down, whatever people's ideology is, they come to a point where they have to wake up and smell the coffee. The system is coming up. They have to do something. And then maybe there's an opportunity there before we go completely to the end of the line. As you said, these are interesting times. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I hope uh, our listeners out there will take action. I do too.